Uh, so, the first thing you have to know, and in the interest of full disclosure, and all of you know this, I did not vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> I have been a uh, severe critic of Donald Trump, and those of you who listen to me on KGO, as I will be on tomorrow night at 7 o'clock with Pat Thurston, uh, know that I've been a severe critic. But I want to step back and explain to you that I am also viewed as a scholar of the American presidency. Some of you have taken my courses at the Fromm Institute or at Dominican University, and over many, many years, many decades, I've had the pleasure of lecturing on the nature of the American presidency. So the comments that I'm making today are not partisan. I want to be crystal clear about that. I'm not here as a Democrat or as a Republican. I'm here as an American who is deeply concerned about where we are today. So I want to begin with a single defining word, dysfunctional. The Trump presidency is dysfunctional. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, it's very clear that there are serious problems in this White House. And I want to be crystal clear when I say that the last thing America needs in a world filled with crisis is a dysfunctional president, or a dysfunctional presidency, or for that matter, a dysfunctional White House. Now, some will say that they knew this would happen. But my answer is, although I was not a Trump supporter and highly critical of it, I had every expectation that once he walked into the Oval Office, a light would go on. Something would happen which would compel him, as has been the case with previous presidents, to understand the gravity of the job they had. So let me now try to analyze where we are. The first thing you need to know is that the Trump White House has not been honest. Every day there is a new revelation. Now, you all know that I work for Richard Nixon. Uh, I knew all the fellows in the White House very well. So when I say that I can see when people are not being honest, trust me, I can. <laughs> this morning we discovered that yet another individual, a lobbyist, was in the meeting, which Jared Kushner and Donald Trump Jr. and Paul Manafort had with a Russian agent. Now let's be clear. We don't know exactly the nature of the attorney's role. We know that in the email trail, which Donald Trump revealed, and I hasten to point out, revealed only because the New York Times was about to break the story. It was not a voluntary disclosure. It was a disclosure made out of necessity. We know that Donald Trump believed he was going into a meeting where information on Hillary Clinton would be delivered. We know that the top three people dealing with the Trump campaign were in that meeting. The president's son, the president's son-in-law, and the president's manager. We know now that there was an additional lobbyist there, and we're told there may have been one other person there. We now know that the president's lawyers knew about this meeting a month ago. And we know that Donald Trump, with a straight face, says, there's nothing there. Well, we now know there is. There are calls for the security clearance to be pulled from Jared Kushner. Not because the president isn't entitled to have his son-in-law as an advisor, but because I believe it is now the fourth time that Jared Kushner has had to amend his disclosure statement in order to get a security clearance. We have a president who is in denial. Despite the fact that everyone knows that the Russians attempted to interfere in the election, the president has consistently, until this week, said, no, no, it's not true. Phony news, fake news, not true. It is true. We now have Democrats and Republicans 
who are saying that what the Russians attempted to do was a direct assault on American democracy. Now, those of you who heard me speak here the last time, the time before that, the time before that, heard me say that. Not because I had any particular inside information, but because it was clear and self-evident that there was a severe problem. We understand that the President has nominated a new director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who will be confirmed. Dianne Feinstein will support him. The Democrats appear to be in line. He seems to be a very able man. But on the very day when he gave testimony, the President said, there's nothing to this, and his nominee for director of the FBI said, yes, there is. In contradiction of all of the American intelligence agencies, the President continues to say, it's a phony story. It's fake news. I want to say a word about the issue of fake news. I've been in the media for a long time. Many of you listen to me on the radio. By the way, I'll be on KGO uh, this Saturday night at 7 o'clock with Pat Thurston. But I have been for decades doing commentary on the radio and on television. Trust me when I tell you that news people do not invent news. Commentators may invent news. Radio talk show hosts <laughs> may invent news. But news people who work in a newsroom in a legitimate news operation are not fake news. I know that Fox News is part of the right. I know that CNN leans to the left. I know that when I listen to NBC, ABC, or CBS, I'm generally getting news. Particularly when I listen on the radio. I listen to the CBS hourly news on the hour whenever I'm awake. We are blessed in this country to have a vital, vibrant news industry with outstanding reporters who do a great job, by and large, in delivering the news. And when the President of the United States continues to assault the media in the way he does, I'm appalled. And let me tell you, when the President of the United States chooses to appear on Pat Roberts' 700 Club, and when the President of the United States appears on Fox News, I have to tell you clearly, he is not interested in a real straight news analysis. I also believe in presidential press conferences. I don't believe you shut off cameras. I don't believe that you decline to hold a press conference. And this president has not held a press conference in months. What happened yesterday with President Macron is not a press conference. There was a limit to the number of questions that could be posed. And indeed, very often, the president chooses the reporters who will ask the questions in order to guarantee that it will be a limited interrogation. And that's what it is. When I do an interview on KGO, I interrogate the people who are on with me, because that's my job. My job is to dig and ask tough questions and try to get appropriate answers, or inappropriate answers, as the case may be. I was appalled by the President's comments. But what really disturbed me was that there was not indignation by the American people. I want to remind you that the President, before his election, said that if he shot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue, his supporters would continue to believe him. When Richard Nixon resigned the presidency, on August the 9th, 1974, 30% of the American people did not want him to resign. 30% of the American people believed it was fake news that was bringing him down. I want you to understand that about 30% of the American people stand with Donald Trump today. Because you can confront people with clear and present evidence 
And they are still not willing to admit that there is a problem. Now, I want to say a word about a real failure. And I say this with some regret. I was a Republican for many years. I was president of the Teenage Republicans. I was very active in Republican politics. I worked for Richard Nixon and for a number of other Republicans. Yesterday, I had the pleasure of sitting with the former chairman of the Republican Party here in San Francisco, Ed Osgood, who lives right across the street. Ed's going to turn 100 next year. His mind clears a bell. And Ed and I talked about it because neither one of us is a Republican today. And one of the great tragedies which we are seeing is the implosion of the Republican Party. I remember vividly on August the 7th, 1974, when Barry Goldwater, Senator from Arizona, Republican nominee for president in 1964, Mr. Republican, Mr. Conservative, went down to the White House with Hugh Scott, who was the Republican leader in the Senate, and John Rhodes, the Republican leader in the House. When they came to tell the president it was over, Dick Nixon turned to Barry Goldwater and said, how many votes do I have in the Senate, Barry? And Goldwater responded, you have six at most, Mr. President, and I am not one of them. <laughs> it is not the Democrats who are on the spot. It is not the Democrats who are critical in this game. It is the Republicans. And there is panic among Republicans, including Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate, and Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, who I would remind you was Mitt Romney's pick for Vice President in the 2012 presidential election. They understand that the Republican Party is on the spot. And that in the end, what Donald Trump does or does not do will reflect profoundly on the Republican Party. They are looking at the election in 2018. They want to retain control of the House and Senate. And it is going to be tough if these revelations keep coming day by day, drip by drip, every day. I sleep very well during the night. I usually sleep through the night, no problem. I wake up now at 3 o'clock in the morning. Every morning. To hear at 6 o'clock in Washington. To hear what Donald Trump's latest tweet is. <laughs> Speaking as a radio talk show host, let me tell you, Donald Trump is the gift who keeps right on giving. <laughs> now we chuckle about it, but I want to remind you of Watergate. And all of you in this room are old enough to remember that every day there was another revelation. That every day the credibility of the president was more severely eroded. And it didn't matter whether Richard Nixon took a trip to the Middle East or to the Soviet Union, as he did in the closing months of his administration. A foreign trip did not distract from the crisis that was building in this country. And the same thing applies to Donald Trump. Now, I want to spend a few minutes with you on some domestic issues and some foreign policy issues, which we should be talking about. Let me first talk about the health care bill, which the Republicans are proposing. The President and the Republicans in Congress pledged to repeal and replace Obamacare. Now, I don't think anybody in this room is on Obamacare. You're all over 65. You all have your Medicare cards. You have supplemental insurance. So all of you are well protected. But some 23 million Americans are on Obamacare, which should be called by its proper name, the Affordable Care Act. You will recall that when Obamacare passed, the Republicans attacked it bitterly saying there were no congressional hearings, that there was no time to examine the bill, that it was being forced through the Congress. By the way, all of that was true. And the Republican implication was, if we are in power, that will never happen. Please note it's happened. Now, the odds are, although anything can happen in the next week or two, that the Republican plan to repeal and replace will fail. Oh, by the way, Mitch McConnell must have been furious when the president suggested 
in one of his tweets, let's just repeal it. We can replace it later. Undermining the entire Republican argument. That repeal and replace should go hand in hand. I want to say a word about entitlements. Everybody in this room gets Social Security, and everybody in this room has Medicare. By the way, congratulations. There will be an increase on January. I think it's $28 a month or something. <laughs> Certainly we'll pay for nothing here, but that's okay. <laughs> what is an entitlement? An entitlement means that you paid in, and therefore you were entitled to take out. Anybody who views an entitlement in a pejorative sense is wrong. You may disagree with the balance of payments and so forth. That's a whole other issue. But you're entitled to it because you paid into it. And I want to remind you that when Social Security, the Social Security Act was passed in 1935, since then there have been many changes to Social Security. And with Medicare, passed in 1965, there have been many changes uh, in Medicare, what's covered, what isn't covered. Those entitlements are not going anywhere. And Obamacare is not going anywhere either. There will be changes to it, and there should be changes to it, because it frankly was not the best written bill. You've heard me say before, if I had been President of the United States, I wouldn't have written a whole new bill. Hell, I would have simply expanded Medicare down generationally. It's an existing program. It works. We would have had to charge more in terms of taxes. But think of all the money that would have been saved. But we now have a program. And they may make changes in it, but it's not going away. And whether it's because of the opioid epidemic in the Midwest, and the East, and the South, and the North, and the West, or whether it's because too many constituents who voted for Trump are coming back and saying the president promised during the campaign that we would be covered by a cheaper, more effective plan, the Republicans understand Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Ohio, Michigan. Those states went to Trump, and that is the reason why Trump was elected. The people in those states have Obamacare. They have the Affordable Care Act, and the last thing they want to do is lose that benefit. Now, I don't know what's going to happen, but I can tell you that the Republicans have got a big problem, because they base their campaign on the idea that they would repeal and replace and they promised their voters, and if they can't deliver on a promise when the Republicans control the House, the Senate, and the White House, there's a problem. Do you understand this? Remember, the American people don't vote for most of the time. We vote against. And if the Republicans fail to deliver on their promise, they're in trouble. And they know. By the way, this morning, Susan Collins announced she will vote no. She's on the, I can't say the left of the Republican Party, because there is no left in the Republican Party, but she's a, a moderate, per se. And Rand Paul, who is to the right of the Republican Party, said they would vote no. Now, Ted Cruz is going to vote yes, because one of the things he wanted is being included, which means you can buy a modified health insurance plan, which, which you know, doesn't cover everything. I mean, it's... It, it, it's almost comical, but sad. The Republicans have also an agenda of revising the tax code. It's going nowhere. Because their idea of a tax code is to benefit the rich. Now, that's all of us in this room, because you can afford to live here. You're someone who has money. I'm someone who has money. But we understand that there are real limitations that come when you don't have the votes in the Congress to get your bill through. And that is precisely where we are now. So let me be clear. The Republicans have been in power for six months. They have not passed a single piece of legislation. And the only real thing that the President can claim is Neil Gorsuch, who was confirmed to the United States Supreme Court. Now, there have been a number of key decisions on four critical decisions. Judge Gorsuch, who promised to be objective, has voted with Clarence Thomas. So it's very clear that Neil Gorsuch is going to the right. And let me point out to you, and I said this before the election, that we weren't just voting for a president, we were voting for a Supreme Court. 
that if there is another vacancy on the court from the liberal wing, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg is 84 and not in the best of health, the court will take a decided swing to the right. But more critical, perhaps, for us, are the lower courts. And all of you are aware that there are a thousand vacancies on the federal district courts, in which the Republicans refused to fill when Barack Obama was president, because they counted on a Republican president and a Republican Senate, they've got it, and the courts are now going to take that decided swing to the right. There's no question. We also are aware that this morning, uh, or last night actually, the president suffered a real blow on his ban on travel and immigration. A court in Hawaii has expanded it to include grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. Now I have to tell you that the Supreme Court did not choose to do what the lower courts did and take into account the fact that Donald Trump's language against Muslims was highly pejorative. The court instead said, we're only going to count what he says as president. But there is no doubt, and we need to know this, that the intent of the president was clearly a prejudice against Muslims. Now let me be clear about this. I am the author, co-author of a book called Icon of Evil, Hitler's Mufti and the Rise of Radical Islam. You want to talk about radical Islam? Believe me, I can do it in depth. I do it all the time. I'm considered an expert. There's no doubt that radical Islam is a danger. But whether or not that danger applies to what the president has done in restricting a whole group of people is one that we should need to ask about. I want to say a few words about foreign policy. As you know, the president has, is in France with President Macron. We know that the Europeans are very skeptical of Donald Trump. Our strongest ally in the middle in uh, Europe is Germany. Angela Merkel, the Chancellor, who will in all likelihood be re-elected in a few months, Angela Merkel said she no longer trusts American leadership. What she meant by that is she doesn't trust the leadership of Donald Trump. And it is clear that the Europeans are highly skeptical of Donald Trump. And all of the nice conversation with President Macron does not in any way diminish from that lack of trust. We have a problem with our European allies. Now the President, who was not committed to Article 5 of NATO, now has announced he is. Thank God, because NATO is an important part of our defense. And frankly, if the Europeans never paid a nickel, it would be worth every penny we put in. But the Europeans are going to pay. But we're still going to pay most of the cost for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which has been the most critical alliance we've had since the end of the Second World War. In large measure, we defeated the Soviet Union without firing a shot. Not only because of economics, but because of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. I want to say a word about the stalemate we face in Ukraine and Crimea. Once Vladimir Putin decided to go into Crimea, there was nothing we could do to dislodge him short of a war in Europe. And nobody wants a war in Europe. All the sanctions we may apply mean nothing when you really boil it down. And you know who's really worried? Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania. Because we understand Vladimir Putin's goal is to recreate the Russian Empire. Not just the Soviet Empire, the Russian Empire. And that's why NATO is so critical. And if you ask the people in Poland, in Hungary, in the Czech Republic, in Slovakia, about the critical aspect of NATO, they understand it and we must too. I want to say a word, if I can, about the major foreign policy issue that confronts us. North Korea. North Korea has a nuclear capability. <coughs> they have exploded five devices. They have an ICBM, that's Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Capability. And we have seen them launch, as recently as this last week, an ICBM which theoretically could have reached the continental United States. 
Now, we don't know whether they have the ability to mount a nuclear weapon on an ICBM, but we know they have the range to send it. I want to be crystal clear. The president of North Korea has threatened Australia with a nuclear explosion, has threatened the northern islands of Japan with a nuclear hit. And by the way, the northern islands of Japan are now going through all of the air raid kind of process to learn what to do in case there were an attack. The North Koreans have threatened South Korea. And you understand you don't need an ICBM to drop a bomb on Seoul, which is 30 miles south of the demilitarized zone. All you need is an airplane. That's what we used in 1945 at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Remember the old game? An airplane dropping a low-grade nuclear weapon would incinerate a million people in a millisecond. Now, you understand that North Korea has a million-man army, and because in North Korea people starve to death, the one place you are going to be fine is if you're in the army. They're clothed, they're fed, they're taken care of. We face a crisis on the Korean Peninsula. And because the president of North Korea is a dictator who clearly is not rational. By the way, you know I love this story. In case anybody here is thinking about falling asleep while I'm speaking. The defense minister of North Korea fell asleep at a cabinet meeting. The president whipped out a gun and shot him. Killed him right there. <laughs> Not that I carried a weapon. <laughs> but you understand we are caught on the horns of a dilemma because if a nuclear weapon were used, or if North Korea decided to engage its million man army in an invasion of South Korea, we would be in big trouble. We have about 38,000 troops in South Korea. Now I want to take this a step further because I learned a lesson the other day. I read a book. I do a lot of reading. It's the way I learn. And the book that I read is The President versus the General. It had to do with Harry Truman and Douglas MacArthur. Now, I have always believed that Harry Truman was right when he made the decision to fire General MacArthur. Lincoln fired McClellan. Marshall, uh, rather, uh, Truman fired uh, uh, MacArthur. And the reason was that we have a civilian dominance of the military. You all understand that. And I've always defended Harry Truman. Those of you who have taken my courses on the Truman presidency know that I defended But I learned a very valuable lesson because I began reading what General MacArthur said to Harry Truman and to the Joint Chiefs. General MacArthur said, do you understand that if North Korea survives, this will be a recurring problem over many, 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 many years? And it turns out there were two rights. Harry Truman was right, but so was General MacArthur. I think of that every time I drive through the General MacArthur tunnel when I go to Marine County. We have a real problem when it comes to what to do about North Korea. How stunning it is that in this city, where the United Nations was founded, in order to prevent war, the scourge of war from hitting future generations, we now confront a situation which could have devastating consequences for our country and our planet. I want to say a word about the Middle East. All of you know that the administration is celebrating the fall of Raqqa, the seat of Islamic State. Well, any Vietnam vets here in the room? If you remember, during Vietnam, we would go into a, an area but the Viet Cong controlled. We'd throw the Viet Cong out. We'd, we'd cleanse the area, liberate it, and then you know what happened. We'd leave and who came right back? The Viet Cong. Make no mistake. Iraq doesn't have an army. What we have done is to help what remains of that army to liberate Raqqa. They couldn't have done it without us. And the minute we withdraw from Syria or from Iraq, you know the consequences, particularly in Iraq, where that government would fall without our support. In Syria, right now, we face a serious problem. The Russians want Assad to remain in power. We advocated the removal of Assad under 
President Obama. We no longer do it with good reason. Obama was wrong on that call because you know that if Assad is deposed, what will emerge is a radical Islamic regime in Syria. It's very important to understand for every action, there is a reaction. There is no stability in the Middle East, and that was proven this morning. We're on the Temple Mount. What the Jews call Har Havait, what the Arabs call Baram El Sharif, the noble sanctuary. Two Druze policemen were gunned down by Palestinians. Uh, the idea here is, frankly, as I read the report this morning, uh, to cause a crisis over Jerusalem. Uh, let me be crystal clear. The Middle East, in its entirety, is also very dangerous. The Israelis understand that Iran is still committed to a nuclear weapon which would be directed against them. It's delayed because of the nuclear agreement for another six or seven years. Then the agreement expires, you can be sure Iran will then develop a nuclear weapon. The Israelis are very concerned. And interestingly enough, the Israelis were included in the process of the ceasefire in Syria. Now, please understand, that ceasefire is about a week old. Trust me, it's not a real ceasefire. People are still being killed, there's still a war going on. But the president yesterday touted this as a victory. I can guarantee you when I'm back here again, we'll be talking about Syria. <coughs> what I wanted to emphasize in spending a few minutes on foreign policy is the world is in disarray. And I want to take it a step further. We have a Secretary of State by the name of Rex Tillerson. Nobody listens because he's not quoted on anything he says. He travels abroad and they won't even let media travel. Frankly, if I were Secretary Tillerson, who has had his words turned around and the rug pulled out from under him repeatedly, I wouldn't even be there. And we have Jim Mattis, who's Secretary of Defense. The President is far more cautious about James Mattis because Mattis' credibility is so high. But if I were General Mattis, I wouldn't be happy either. In the end, all of you need to understand that foreign policy is made by the President of the United States. I would remind you that Harry Truman recognized a reborn state of Israel unilaterally in 1948. That Richard Nixon flew to Beijing unilaterally in 1972. That the President of the United States, and I could give you example after example, of a president's supremacy in foreign policy. When I began today, I suggested that we have a dysfunctional presidency. My friends, we live in a very dangerous world. And the idea that we have a president who is dysfunctional, whose White House is not organized, who relies on his family to run the country, should disturb every single American. And if I were a Republican, I would be horrified at what this president is doing to the Republican Party. Mind you, he was never a Republican, never a conservative. But because he is president of the United States, he is technically now the leader of the Republican Party. What does this mean for us? I want you to be aware that there are several tracks in terms of an investigation. The president would like to fire Bob Mueller, the former director of the FBI, who is now the special counsel, which is the equivalent of being independent counsel or special prosecutor. They simply changed the wording. This is a man who is one of the most respected men in Washington. He is putting together a team to do this investigation no doubt the president is worried. He has good reason to be worried about it. <clears throat> if anything, untoward happened. And I can tell you that the president would like to fire Mueller as he fired Jim Comey, but he can't. His hands are tied. And I expect Mueller to do a thorough investigation and if I were the president, based on what has happened in the last few days, on top of everything else, I would be very concerned. We have the United States Senate, several key committees conducting investigations. 
We have the House of Representatives, several key committees conducting investigations. And we have a free press, which is constantly revealing new information. Thank God for a free press. And every time the President of the United States attacks the press, you have to worry. Because without a free press, we would know nothing about any of this. Remember, the only reason Donald Trump Jr.'s email trail was released was because the New York Times was about to run with the story. And the White House, or at least their attorneys, decided to get ahead of the game. I want to leave you plenty of time for questions, but I want to just express a personal view. I've been in this game for a long time. I do analysis, as you know, not only on the radio and on television, but around the country. I have never been as scared for my country as I am today. And I repeat, I don't say it as a Democrat or as a Republican. I say it as an American. And every single person in this room, and all Americans, regardless of party, should be concerned. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me stop now and take whatever questions you have. About a half an hour to fire away. Did I tell you your grade depended on your questions? <laughs> yes. Um, I'll repeat the question for the camera. From what I understand, uh, the president still has a base that supports him of uh, 35 to 40 percent of the electorate. How do you explain that with all that's happening in Washington, these people don't see what's going on? question is, uh, how can the president still have a base of between 30 and 40 percent based on what's going on? I was at the Nixon Library uh, last month. I go down to the library, I see old friends. A lot of them dead, but. <laughs> and one of the most interesting things is, well, I was recognized, and somebody came up and said, John, can you explain a little about the library? And of course, I was happy to do it. And as we're walking through, this gentleman, who is a docent, by the way, and a lovely man, said, it isn't it terrible what they did to President Nixon? They, they persecuted him. They forced him out of office. And he really didn't do anything wrong. By the way, when he said it to me, we were walking through the Watergate gallery. <laughs> what I want to point out to you is people are unwilling to admit error. By the way, that applies to all of us in the room. It's generally somebody else's fault. It, it's a defense mechanism built into who we are as human beings. If something goes wrong here, it's never your fault, it's always management's fault. And you have to know <laughs> that sometimes it isn't. And the reality was, even with Richard Nixon, where the, and we're standing right in front of the smoking gun tape. I said, would you like to listen to the, uh, to the uh, tape where President Nixon on June 23rd, uh, 1972, uh, tried to obstruct justice? Uh, his discussion with Bob Holman? But don't confuse people with the facts. And part of this has to do with our inability, innately, not to be willing to admit that we were at fault. All of you have been in traffic accidents at some point in your life. It's always the other guy's fault. It's never your fault. It is a natural defense mechanism. So I was in Indiana. My father-in-law passed away, 92 years old, very easy, no pain or suffering surrounded by his family. But I went back to Indiana, which is Trump country, it's Pence country. And it was fascinating to talk with people who were willing to defend the president in a situation which is indefensible. And my answer to you is, that is human nature. Now the tragedy for the Republican Party and for the country is, but I want a vital, vibrant two-party system. I want a Republican Party that presents an alternative, as I want a Democratic Party that presents an alternative. I don't want to walk into the voting booth and be able to vote only one way. I value the fact that there are diversity of ideas and 
Sometimes people I don't always agree with may be pretty good at what they do. But do you understand when I say dysfunctional, this White House is incompetent. Unbelievable. Can you imagine a White House press office which won't turn on the cameras? Can you imagine a press secretary who doesn't want to be interviewed or will only open his or her office to a few select people? I mean, it's inconceivable. Not even Richard Nixon did that. And what I find particularly distressing is that there isn't deep distress. Now, we live in San Francisco. San Francisco, I will grant you, is a bit of a bubble. <laughs> but I would like to think the country is smarter than what we are encountering now. Now, let me say a quick word, just quickly. Somebody always asks me about impeachment or removal from office. In the end, Richard Nixon was removed from office for two reasons. One, he lied as the June 23rd, 1972 tape proved. But number two, it wasn't the Democrats who got rid of Richard Nixon. It was the Republicans. The story I told you about Barry Goldwater, Hugh Scott, and John Lewis. What brought Nixon down was his own hubris. Now, the Democrats controlled Congress, but they couldn't bring him down alone. It had to be with the Republicans. In this case, the Republicans controlled Congress. And let me just explain to you impeachment. Impeachment means that a majority of the House of Representatives presents articles that say that a president should be removed from office for the following reasons. But impeachment does not remove a president from office. It is a trial in the Senate. And conviction by 67 senators, two-thirds of the Senate. It has never happened in our history. The closest we came, perhaps, was Andrew Johnson in 1868, who was saved by one vote, the vote of Edmund Ross of Kansas. And if you have a copy of Profiles and Courage in the Sequoia Library, take a look at the chapter on Edmund Ross. Richard Nixon would have been impeached by the House and convicted by the Senate, but he resigned before that process began. And Bill Clinton was impeached by the House of Representatives but was acquitted by the United States Senate. So removal from office is a very tough thing to accomplish. But I want you to be aware of something, and I say this very reluctantly, but I want you to, this is your homework assignment. So I have a library, as many of you know, 15,000 volumes, 3,000 of which are signed or inscribed. And yes, I've read every book in my library. And I read about 400 books a year. Fortunately, I have a good mind and I retain a lot of what I read. In 1964, there was a magazine called Fact Magazine. I have an original copy of that magazine. 1,322 psychiatrists say Barry Goldwater is unfit to be president of the United States. And of course, not a single one of those psychiatrists had examined Barry Goldwater. And Goldwater actually went to court and won a judgment against the publisher of that magazine. Very often, people say to me, you think Donald Trump is stable? I'm not a physician, although across the street, uh, I speak, uh, as you know, the Carlisle. Uh, there is a psychologist and there is a psychiatrist, two lovely people, who are convinced Donald Trump is out of his mind. And I say to both of them, have you examined him? No. I don't know about you, but if a doctor doesn't take a hard look at me, I don't take a doctor's diagnosis. But there is a provision, the 25th Amendment to the Constitution. Now, that was adopted in 1967, authored by Birch Bayh of Indiana. It was a result of the assassination of, of President Kennedy and the heart attack of President Eisenhower. You may remember the famous picture when Lyndon Johnson spoke before Congress, the two men seated behind him were John W. McCormick, who was in his mid-70s, and Carl Hayden of Arizona, who was 87, I think. And these were two old men who were lying to become president of the United States. And there was a recognition that if there were vacancies, and Johnson, remember, had suffered a heart attack in 1956, 
And so the question of his health would have meant that Speaker McCormick would have become president. And so the process proceeded, and the 25th Amendment was adopted. Now, it's only been applied twice. When Spiro Agnew resigned as vice president, and Richard Nixon nominated Gerald Ford to succeed, and then when Gerald Ford became president and nominated Nelson Rockefeller. I would remind you, the Ford-Rockefeller administration, the first and only time in American history where neither the president or the vice president was elected by the American people. Just an interesting point in case you're ever on Jeopardy. <laughs> now, the reason I say this is because there is a fourth part of the 25th Amendment which has never been applied. And it was written with the intent that what would happen if a president had a stroke or completely incapacitated, but was incapable of saying that he was incapacitated. Alzheimer's wasn't an issue then. Senility, as they called it in those days. But nobody thought it was the kind of problem it is today. The 25th Amendment makes the provision that a majority of the cabinet can vote to take away the powers of the president and transfer them to the vice president that the president, if fully recovered, can reclaim those powers. The only way that can be overturned is by two-thirds of the Congress. If, and by the way, it makes sense. If you have a stroke, you're unable to communicate what you're doing, it makes sense then to be removed. You're still alive, you're on life support, whatever. You still have to have a president of the United States, right? But the question becomes, what happens if the president is unstable? What happens if a president suffers from Alzheimer's? That's why that provision is there. Now, it has never been applied. And the odds of a president's cabinet voting to remove the president who appointed him, <coughs> I think, is very limited. But that provision does exist. And I hope it's never applied. But people ask me, and I'm happy to answer. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I believe in checks and balances, and it seems to be any president or any executive uh, should be more limited. The question is checks and balances. Uh, when you and I were in school, we learned there were three branches of government. The executive, the legislative, and the judicial. And the point was that there was a balance. Now, you understand that at various times, one branch is more dominant than another branch. In the 19th century, the Congress was more powerful than the president in many ways. But I'll be teaching a course on, uh, entitled from TR, from Theodore Roosevelt to Donald Trump, at the Fromm Institute starting in, in September. And I will make the point that the American presidency has changed profoundly. Now, please understand there is a check and a balance. But there has been, since World War II, a disproportionate shift in power to the President of the United States. It is not to say that Congress doesn't have power or that the courts don't have power. We saw in the Vietnam War, where in the end the Congress refused to appropriate money uh, for uh, the continuation of the war in 1975. You saw in the United States versus Richard Nixon, an eight to nothing ruling, uh, only William Rehnquist recused himself because he knew all the parties, over the question of the White House takes, the question of the executive privilege. So the courts can assert themselves, as they are now in the travel ban. But what happens when their authority is exceeded? Now, I give you the most disturbing thing for me. I mean, there's so many things I can talk about. You know, the president has appointed a commission, a commission to examine voter fraud, which is non-existent in terms of the three to four million he claims voted illegally. It's just, it's just rubbish, just nonsense. They've requested secretaries of state of the United States to turn over vital voting information, including social security numbers. About 45 states as of today have refused. Secretaries of states, Democrats and Republicans have said to the president and the vice president who is in charge of that commission, absolutely not. Can you imagine what the Republicans would have done if Barack Obama had tried to establish such a commission? <laughs> there is a hypocrisy, but you are right. I believe in a strong executive, a strong judicial, and a strong legislative <laughs> branch. 
And one of the problems is the Congress needs to get its act together and be more assertive. Yes, sir. I'd like to add another dimension to this conversation. Sure. I think everybody sort of understands your position and agrees with it concerning the presidency and the Republican Party and all those problems. But we have a, a country right now that has a Democratic Party, doesn't have its act together, doesn't have a leadership that looks like it can take on what is going on in the Republican Party. So can you speak a little bit to those issues? I will speak. Uh, the question is about the Democratic Party and its condition. Uh, when you are in opposition, it's very hard. You remember years ago, there was something called the titular head of the party. That meant that the previous defeated candidate for president still exercised power. Wendell Wilkie, Tom Dewey, Adlai Stevenson. I use them as real examples. We no longer have a titular head of the party. You lose the election, you're no longer the head of the opposition. John Kerry, Mitt Romney, Al Gore, they were gone after they lost. The Democratic Party has a job of rebuilding. Now, I love Nancy Pelosi. She's an old and dear friend. But is Nancy Pelosi the future of the Democratic Party? No. And Chuck Schumer is a very able man. But is he the future of the Democratic Party, the majority leader of the Senate? No. And if you look around for 2020, but the Democratic Party has a serious problem. We have potential candidates. Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York. Cory Booker, the senator from New Jersey. Uh, some believe that Kamala Harris, who is our own freshman senator, may have a future. But they are not leaders of an opposition. And the Democratic national chairman, Mr. Perez, is certainly not the leader of an opposition. Nobody really knows who he is. Former cabinet officer, but who knows? I heard him give a speech the other day. I was ashamed. So you are absolutely right. In the end, Donald Trump will be brought down by Donald Trump, if he's brought down at all. But the Democratic Party has an obligation to get its act together. And I don't think they can until the primaries heading toward 2020 begin. And I say that with a sense of sadness, in a way. But that's the reality. And by the way, I love, I love Nancy Pelosi. She's doing a great job. You know why she's still leader of the Democrats? Because she raises money. <laughs> she raises money prodigiously. How many of you, no, don't answer the question, but every single one of you in this room, if you're a registered Democrat and you live in Nancy Pelosi's district, you've been asked to contribute. I know you have. I have. But she raises millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. And there is no Democrat in Congress who can do what she has done. Yes, sir. Um, I know it's tough to make predictions, but uh, given all that you've said, uh, in between now and 2020, what do you think the most probable thing to happen to the Trump presidency? The question is, what, what is the most probable thing to happen to the Trump presidency between now and 2020? I don't know. And I'm not going to try to predict it, but I will tell you this. If there is a smoking gun, if it is proven that Donald Trump, for instance, let me just give you the example. I can't say it's true or not. Before the meeting that took place at Trump Towers, Donald Trump announced Next Monday, I'm going to give a speech about Hillary Clinton, and I'm going to expose everything. Is the reason he said that because his son-in-law or his son said to him, we're meeting with this person from Russia, and we'll have information? Of course, he never gave that speech. We live in a country in which a person is presumed innocent until proven guilty. But what they are looking for now is a smoking gun. And somebody asked me, isn't that persecution? No, it's exactly what should happen. There are enough indications of genuine corruption in this administration. And yes, corruption. Let me explain. Has anybody seen Donald Trump's tax returns? Now you know they're going to be uh, they're going to be uh, subpoenaed by Bob Mueller, and we are told that Diane Feinstein 
is going to have the Senate Intelligence Committee subpoena them as well. <coughs> Why hasn't the President released his tax returns? And then there's the Emoluments Clause to the Constitution, which forbids a President of the United States from profiting from his office while in office. It will apply after you leave, too. But the point being, we don't know. Now, I am a reasonable person. I want to believe that the President of the United States is an honest man who tells the truth. I don't have to add anything to him. There's going to be an investigation. Now, you all have me back. But next week, I know you're all going to be listening to your television sets because, theoretically, Donald Trump Jr. will be testifying under oath before Congress. And so will the President's son-in-law be testifying before Congress under oath. And by the way, will his security clearance be lifted? We started with that. And what will Manafort say when he is asked to testify? <coughs> and what about the Attorney General of the United States? who didn't tell the truth during his own hearing. Trust me, if Harry Truman had been in the White House, he would have fired Jeff Sessions, without any question. You remember, you're old enough to remember, this is a great question for you. You remember the name Sherman Adams? Sherman Adams was President Eisenhower's chief of staff from 1953 to 1958. Sherman Adams was the governor of New Hampshire before he came to the White House. Sherman Adams was an honest man. He really was. He was uh, the guy who was the no Mr. No in the Eisenhower White House. He accepted a Vicuna coat and a freezer. And for that, he went into political disgrace. <laughs> what kind of standards do we have now? Oh, did I tell you? I'm taking everybody at the Sequoias who's in this room to Washington, D.C. You're my guests. <laughs> and we're going to fly first class, whole place. This is on tape, isn't it? <laughs> and we have two hotels we can stay at. One is the Old Willard, which is haunted. And I love the Willard Hotel. Or, because we love to get a little something from the government for the Sequoias, we can stay at the Trump Hotel. <laughs> now, it's going to cost us a little bit more. Where are you going to stay if you're a foreign leader coming to Washington? You know where they're going? The Trump Hotel. I believe if you're President of the United States, you want to have to divest yourself from every single holding that you have. Everything ought to go into a blind trust. I'm delighted to tell you, Jimmy Carter did that, you know? And when he came out of the White House, his peanut business was bankrupt. I don't know how many of you know that. But Harry Truman had a rule. Harry Truman was invited to serve on boards after he left the presidency. He wouldn't do it. And my old boss, Richard Nixon, whatever you want to say about Dick Nixon, also accepted no board positions, nothing. Harry Truman, Richard Nixon, all presidents have made money from selling their memoirs. That they should do. But frankly, when Ronald Reagan went to Japan and was paid $2 million for a speech, I was outraged. Those of you who heard me on the radio in those days know I was outraged. The presidency of the United States shouldn't be for sale when you're in office or when you're out of office. And there ought to be federal legislation which says that. If I were in Congress, by God, I'd introduce it. Remember, we subsidize former presidents. We give them a pension. We give them an office. We give them a staff. We give them Secret Service protection, at least for the first 10 years, but it's always extended because there's a fear of problems. There is something fundamentally wrong. You want to read a good book, read Mr. Citizen by Harry Truman. It was published in 1959. It's an easy read. And Truman defines what a former presidency should be. Yes? Uh, you talk so much about the situation. I'd like to know what you think we as individuals and as citizens should be doing to help to change this. The question is, what should we as citizens be doing? You have to be informed. If I told you, but the attention span of the American people is so limited, it's unbelievable. And by the way, the news cycle runs so quickly that even I have a hard time keeping track day to day of all the scandals. What do you do? 
First of all, I believe in being in touch with your member of Congress. In fact, you ought to invite Nancy Pelosi to come to the towers and speak. You all vote. How many people live in the towers? I mean, uh, in, in the how many people, where am I today? How many, can you erase that? How many people live in the Sequoias? 350. Huh? 350? You get 350 people in a room, believe me, Nancy Pelosi will come and talk to you. And you should be able to ask her questions. I said, I did the same thing with Towers. I told him the same thing. I did it yesterday at the Carlisle. I said, for heaven's sake, you are a, and I did it at the Magnolia down in Millbrae, because I said, you are voters. <coughs> and you vote. Number two, I write letters. I believe in writing letters. And you may have people in this room who are very good letter writers who could write an op-ed for the San Francisco Chronicle, or could write a letter to the editor. And every single one of you should be sure that everybody here is registered to vote. And by the way, the other thing you should do is watch the news together. I hope that when uh, the testimony is given, the next week, you're all listening to it. Where am I? Yes, go ahead. I want to ask you on the Republican Party, because they're so split from their beliefs, from the conservatives to the moderates, how are they really ever going to be able to solve the problem? And should we start a third party. The question is about the differences in the Republican Party and uh, is a third party viable? So let me answer these questions carefully. Some of you know I just finished over the last year teaching a history of the Republican Party and a history of the Democratic Party at the Fromm Institute. I right? the same classes at Dominican University. Remember the Democratic Party was not a united party. It was made of northern liberals and southern segregationists and states writers. And that was during the Roosevelt years and the Truman years and the Kennedy years. Uh, there were constant compromises being made. Uh, our political parties are not unitary. There used to be a liberal wing of the Republican Party, of which I was active. I'm the biographer of Harold Stassen. And uh, there was a conservative wing of the Republican Party. Uh, parties in the end try to form consensus and coalition. One of the great tragedies in this country is that the Democratic Party has become the party of liberals and the Republican Party the party of theoretical conservatives and libertarians. I preferred the day when there was a liberal Republican and a conservative Democrat. And I've used the analogy here, but I'll use it again. Why is Congress so dysfunctional? In the old days, you could reach across the aisle. A liberal Republican and a liberal Democrat could make a common coalition. Conservative Democrat and conservative Republican. Think of a bird flying, okay? If you clip a wing, can a bird fly? No. That's the problem Congress. We clip the wing in these two parties, and now there's no way to reach across the aisle. Uh, and that's a real tragedy. A third party, anybody know the last time a third party won an election in this country? <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, 1860. And I have to explain to you that there have been third party efforts. Uh, most notably in the 20th century, Theodore Roosevelt in 1912. And if you stop and think, Henry Wallace in 1948. Anybody here vote for Henry Wallace in 48? Uh, if you're going to admit it. But Strom Thurmond ran as well. George Wallace. Don't tell me if you voted for Wallace in 68. And Ross Perot. Oh, God. But I, I tell you this, and Nader, Ralph Nader ran. Third parties don't work, and there's a reason. If I were going to create a third party, I'd start electing members of Congress. The Republicans in 1854 ran members for the Congress and won. In 1856, they nominated John C. Fremont for president. Anybody here remember the slogan? Free men, free land, Fremont. Great slogan. They elected enough members of Congress that the Republicans, not in control of the White House because James Buchanan won the election, the Republicans elected a Speaker of the House of Representatives. They ran candidates for Congress in 1858. In 1860, they nominated Abraham Lincoln for president. But they had a foundation. You remember? We had, uh, in uh, Minnesota, Jesse Ventura, elected as an independent. He was a failure. And by the way, that is a lesson. You want somebody with a political party behind. So if I had been Ross Perot, had his money, and sanity, <laughs> I would have invested in running candidates for Congress before I ran for president myself. Because any time you base a political party on one person, 
it's doomed to fail. The reason why the two-party system in this country works is because the party transcends the individual. And that's the challenge the Republicans have. They have to be able to transcend Donald Trump. Republicans got over Richard Nixon. By the way, you remember that when Nixon left office, the midterm election, Nixon resigned August 9th, the midterm election was in November, the Democrats, who already controlled Congress, swept the elections in the midterm of 74. So I think that's what the Republicans are looking at now. They understand they're in trouble. And the question is, who's their leadership? You know, they've got uh, Mike Pence. And let me tell you, Mike Pence is an interesting man. Uh, he served six years in Congress, four years as governor of Indiana. Now, there's a slight problem with Mike Pence, in my judgment, just my partisan point of view. He's slightly to the right of Attila the Hun. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, go up to your room and Google Mike Pence on evolution. And you will find he's a creationist. He gave a four-minute speech on the floor of the House of Representatives. Do I want somebody who denies science as president of the United States? Do I want somebody who's president who favors prayer in school? By the way, I always said a prayer in school. Before every test, I set aside my prayer. <laughs> but I remember, because I was a kid, a nice Jewish boy, when they recited the Lord's Prayer in my elementary school. I remember my teacher, who was a nice Irish Catholic lady, and I was horrified. And I was a kid. Uh, we have a, a rule of separation of church and state in this country. Doesn't mean you can't have a private prayer. Mike Pence is in favor, uh, as to the question of abortion, Mike Pence is opposed to abortion, even in the case of rape and incest. I mean, the thought that Mike Pence would be president of the United States? So, Ron Owens, my distinguished colleague at KGO, and I had a discussion on the air recently. Would you rather have Trump or Pence? <laughs> By the way, I made the argument for Pence, because at least Pence has political judgment. Ron, yesterday, I think, repeated the conversation, said he'd rather have Trump than Pence. The other alternative, of course, is the Speaker of the House, who is third in line, but that would require the President and the Vice President to both leave office. Uh, I have to tell you, Paul Ryan is a thoroughly decent man, but he's so far to the right he falls off the deep end. <laughs> so when I look at the Republican Party, look, you want to know what kind of Republican I am? Or was? I was a Dwight Eisenhower, Harold Stass, and Tom Dewey, Alf Land, and Wendell Wilkie. George Christopher, for those of you who are old San Franciscans. Yeah. I was that kind of Republican. You know, George Will, who, by the way, was an active Republican, but who has left the party, great columnist, uh, George Will said, the problem with being a liberal Republican is that it's a little bit like being a high church Unitarian. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible, but pointless. <laughs> if I were 40 years old, I'm 68, and I'm remarkably well preserved for an antique. <laughs> but if I were 40 years old, I would run for Congress when Nancy Pelosi retired, and I would run as a Republican. And I would say to the people of San Francisco, put me in office for two reasons. One, you'll get a moderate Republican who will vote like a Democrat. And number two, I'll sit in the Republican caucus and raise holy hell. <laughs> and what it will require, ultimately, are younger people or older people uh, to do just that. Uh, the Republican Party needs a revolution because it's betrayed its roots. And I'll tell you one quick story. Uh, I was at a 90th birthday party for a very dear friend of ours, Sue D. And sitting at the table was a gentleman I'd never met before. But his close friend and mentor was the former Republican National Committeeman from California. Joe Martin, not to be confused with the Speaker of the House. And we sat there and lamented the fact that neither one of us could be Republicans today because the Republican Party has betrayed its roots. And Bob Dole, who is still alive, was probably the last moderate Republican nominated for president, made the observation that Dwight Eisenhower couldn't be nominated by the Republican Party today, that Richard Nixon couldn't be nominated by the Republican Party today, that Gerald Ford couldn't be nominated by the Republican Party today. And then he laughed and he said, heck, even I couldn't be nominated by the Republican Party today. 
and uh, he also threw in Ronald Reagan, of course. But then this is this is you're right. It's it's, it's a uh, it's a real conundrum. You know, once upon a time, the Republican Party was the great liberal party. Somebody asked me how I ended up being a Republican and not a Democrat. Well, the answer is because when I was a kid, Southern Democrats controlled the Democratic Party. They were segregationists. The Wallaces, the Eastlands, the Stennises, the Dick Russells of Georgia. I was far more comfortable with Nelson Rockefeller and Jack Javits and Earl Warren and Ken Keeney. But that option doesn't exist anymore. And that, that's, that's a tragedy for American democracy. It's a whole other lecture. Is there one more question? I know I've gone over. I'm supposed to end at 11.30. Yes, sir. I have one. Who, who, are there, who are the idealists these days in either the Republican or Democratic Party, the ones that have aspirations for goals for the good rather than for their own personal growth in the political The, the question is, who are the younger Democrats and younger Republicans who are idealists? And the answer is I don't know. I will <laughs> tell you that among the people, the circle that I travel in, most good people won't run for political office. First of all, they won't run because it's very expensive to run. If I decided, if I decided to run for Congress, Nancy retires, I throw my hat in the ring. You know how much it would cost me? I would say a minimum of $10 million. Now, I know that I would come to the Sequoias. I'll get it right away. And, and I would raise that $10 million. You guys, oh, Rothman for Congress, we're right with you, John. Right? But it's far different. I, many of you remember my old boss, Milton Marks. Milton served in the California State Senate, the California Assembly, as a judge for 40 years. First time he ran and won in 1958 for the State Assembly, it cost him about $3,500 for his entire campaign. The last time he ran in 1992, he raised $600,000 and he was really unopposed. Unopposed! After he left office, we were able to distribute the money because, you know, we could do that. So that's part of the problem for people who are idealistic, who want to go into politics. It's not like the old days when you could go out and give a speech on a street corner and somebody would come up and say, by God, I want you to run. We're going to have a mayor's race here in San Francisco. By the way, just so you know this, I was mayor for a day in Youth and Government Day in 1966. <laughs> the best run day in the history of San Francisco. <laughs> So we are going to have candidates for mayor. They're going to spend millions and millions to run for mayor of San Francisco. And I have to tell you, it is deeply distressing, not because I don't want competitive races, but because unless you have a great deal of money, as Gavin Newsom does, or you're lucky and in the right place at the right time, like Ed Lee was, or like Diane Feinstein, who also had of money to run for mayor of San Francisco is a very expensive proposition. And by the way, the pension is not nearly what it is for a former member of Congress. But these are these are issues that we have to grapple with. And I have to tell you, I'm 68. I keep going. I keep speaking about these things. I keep talking about them. And somebody asked me, why do you go to talk to all those old people? <laughs> And I said, what old people? I mean, the fact that you're older doesn't mean you can't think, that you don't have passionate feelings. And one of the things that needs to happen, it's why you should have Nancy Pelosi come and speak, is you need to mobilize yourselves. And it doesn't mean, by the way, that you all have to agree with each other. There may be Trump supporters in the room, or there may be uh, other people who have different points of view. That's great. That's what makes it interesting. I can tell you as a radio talk show host, if people who agreed with me called me all the time, it would be a very dull show. And that's critical. Well, I know, I, I apologize, I've gone 15 minutes over. I don't want to keep you from lunch. So let me tell you, it's always a pleasure to be at the Sequoia. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much.